الإيمان أن السلام حياة قد جاء في القرآن أن السلام Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome to iTrend on ITV. I'm your host, Zahira Baam Ismail. One of the very worrying topics that has come up repeatedly and more in the social, uh, more in the media space over the last few weeks has been the safety of our children. Uh, it's something that whether you're a parent or not a parent, it's something that has troubled many of us. To the point that we've had sleepless nights, many of us have shed a number of tears reading about incidents that have taken place. We bring our children into this world knowing or hoping that they should be protected, trying our best to make sure that they are protected and they have safe spaces. And unfortunately, this is not always the case. We live in a country where it's been shown that women and children are at highest risks of being violated, of not being safe. And at which point do we say this is enough? Or how do we go about saying, what can we do to fix it? You know, uh, I posted on my Facebook page a few weeks ago saying that it was a concern for me because quite a few years back I'd contacted a radio station and they said well there's nothing we can do and I firmly don't believe that there's something we can all do there's something that we should be able to do whether in our capacity as adults whether in our capacity as teachers as professionals as human beings there should be something we should be able to do because we cannot allow this world to deteriorate to the point that we cannot that we have to worry about our children being away from us from even one second or two seconds out of our sight. It's just not normal and it's not okay. And this is not just a South African problem. This is a worldwide problem. So this is not where we are based. Everywhere you go, people are worried about their children. We're worried about women. And we need to make sure that this is something that we're able to combat or even try our best to do. And who better to talk to us than to have the person herself, Dr. Shida Umar, who is the head of the Teddy Bay Clinic. Dr. Shida Umar is renowned in her own right. She is well known in the South African community. Every newspaper article that you pick up when it's related to abuse, to kidnappings, anything to do with children, Dr. Shida Umar is a person to go to because not only is she a beacon of hope, but she stands by so many people that have gone through situations that are so difficult. But she's the person, the go-to person for families, for children, and for us as communities to say, give us something. Tell us how we can go through this. Without further ado, Dr. Shida, assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome for this opportunity, Zahira. Dr. Shida, you are well known not only to the ITV audience, but to the South African community. As I just mentioned to you, I open up newspapers, I see your names, your name in there. Your name is synonymous around children and around women in our country. When we read this, is it okay for us to be feeling so helpless and so hopeless at this point? Well, I think one needs to be aware of the fact that this is definitely on the increase. Mm -hmm. Children are our most marginalized population group. They are more vulnerable because of the dynamic of power, the power mm -hmm. dynamic where children often are in a position to be easily violated. Uh, it is usually older persons or persons in positions of authority that usually would prey on children. And, and what we are seeing is your typical opportunistic predator who finds himself or herself in settings where they have easy access and availability to children. Now, I know that there's been a lot of hype around the Dross restaurant, mm -hmm. and that is not a random isolated incident. I think we need to alert primary caregivers and parents that this has occurred in numerous other restaurants where there's been jumping castles and recreation facilities where children have fallen prey to your typical opportunistic or preferential abuser or sexual predator who has taken advantage of the situation because often what happens when people go or families go to the mall or to a mm. restaurant to, or to a park, people obviously are in a more relaxed yes. mode and can get easily distracted and as you've so beautifully articulated that it is not possible to watch your child 24 11. You cannot let your child out of your sight for one second, I mean, it's 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 in, um, it's just not possible because that would also stifle and stunt the emotional, physical, yes. and psychological growth of the child. So, 
it is unfortunately a reality that we need to start taking responsibility. It's co-responsibility. One needs to realize that whilst parents have a responsibility to ensure the safety and protection of their children, mm. so do other levels and sectors of society have to assume this responsibility. We need to make child protection Yes. our business it's not your business it's not my business it should be everybody's business if we just go back in time the spirit of ubuntu the yes. kindred spirit where it takes a village to raise a child if we all assume responsibility if we actually look out for each and every child out there we wonder why is that child walking on his or her own yes. at this hour or the child is being accompanied as neighbors, accompanied by a stranger. Who is that to the child? Actually exploring or inquiring. That doesn't mean that one is inquisitive. I think it is certainly showing valid concerns. And that is what I'm using a practical example like that, that we all need to be alerted to the well-being of children. Yeah. We cannot always... Uh, you know, come out feeling on top of it to say I was correct because sometimes our assumptions may be uh, false and that's fine. But at the end of the day, we need no, to ensure so. that we are all putting our minds and, and setting children in a space where they will stay safe. I think that's so important. You speak about raising children as a community. And I remember when we were growing up, it was always a community-based uh, raising. Mm. Uh, you, everybody checked where you were, why are you out of the house at this time of the night, where are you going to, and everybody had an, an, almost an interest in making sure you're okay. Have we stepped back to such a point that we worried about interfering, that it now, if it's not my child, I'm not concerned about it and it's okay, I can carry on. Which again leads me to the question, if we're not a parent, if that wasn't my child at the dross, what happens one day when it is? At which point are we saying, I have to take responsibility. I have to stand up that if I see something going wrong, I need to be able to say, actually, this is not okay. Are we okay in our rights to be able to do that? And I think that's what people need to appreciate and recognize that we need to start acting in good faith. Yes. And if we're acting in good faith, it's not because one is being spiteful or because you may have a Mercedes Benz or you have a more beautiful house than I do. But the fact that you are concerned about my child is certainly showing an act of good will. Mm -hmm. And that is where we all need to start understanding that it's not about invading other people's space or being yes. intrusive, but it's actually about caring. And, and that is the kind of ethos that we all need to start adopting because if we do, do not adopt that kind of ethos we're going to find that children will continuously be targeted at and at a much higher incidence and the prevalence will certainly increase at an astronomical rate so i think that is what we need to realize that yes we need to hold all different sectors of society accountable. Mm. Government departments cannot be let off the hook, yes. whether it's the law enforcement agencies like SAPS, then of course the criminal justice system where cases mm. are taken to court, cases cannot be let off lightly, yes. where you know, people are just granted bail willy-nilly or they're not convicted, etc. I think yes. we need to hold everybody accountable, whether it's Department of Home Affairs, you know, how are people yes. accessing valid documents or work permits, etc., the screening. So I, that is what we are talking about when we speak to co-responsibility, holding everybody accountable. Even Absolutely. Department of Education has a huge role to play. You know, when people ask, uh, so what should we be doing about this? So as parents, we need to start talking to our children mm -hmm. when they're little, already at the age of two when they have vocabulary. We need to start engaging with our children. But likewise, your ECD facilities, ECD practitioners mm -hmm. need to be trained, to be skilled on how to interact, how to engage with children, how to identify signs and symptoms of abuse or risky situations. Mm -hmm even your educators. So on different levels, we all need to ensure that we are enabled, empowered, equipped to manage and identify and make sure that the necessary referrals or interventions are implemented. Okay. You mentioned Dr. Shad, and I'm going to come back to saying how we can do this for our own children. 
But when we spoke about the Dross incident, you rightly mentioned, and I'm sure you know in your experience, that this is not a once-off thing. We, it's all the time. The thing is, it doesn't always come into the media, so we don't always hear about it, but I'm, I have no doubt you're seeing this on a daily basis. What is happening in our country? Why has this become, all of a sudden, is it become more prevalent or has it become more access to social media? How are we able to say, why is, has there been a link to why we're seeing an increase in this? So there are numerous factors, the risk factors that contribute to this kind of behavior. I think we need to realize that, of course, because of the uh, criminal justice system not being consistent in their responses, it's not a deterrent. Mm. Because sometimes uh, uh, alleged perpetrators, even if there's evidence or supporting evidence, are let off quite lightly. Mm. So the message conveyed to other potential predators out there, it's okay and they can continue or perpetuate the cycle of violence. So those are one of the you know, risk factors. Mm. But they are also in terms of screening uh, measures where people are placed in settings where they have easy access and availability to children or they are working with children mm. and they haven't undergone rigorous screening procedures. Mm. So again, that is another risk and one needs to consider and factor that and I can continue with other risk factors as well. Absolutely. We're going to have to take a very, very quick ad break. This is a very important discussion to be had. We always know there's never enough time for this. But when we come back after the ad break, we'll continue about what we as parents and educators can do for our children. Stay tuned. Assalamu alaikum and welcome after that ad break. We're chatting to Dr. Shaida Umar from the Teddy Bear Clinic, the director of the Teddy Bear Clinic, but the go-to person in South Africa for anything related to women and children. Dr. Shaida, we were chatting a little bit about these risk factors, why we're seeing it so often. But now, not only are we seeing abuse at various levels, but we're also seeing kidnapping cases. And this is getting worrisome as a parent. Uh, I sit there and I think, I want to do the best I can for my children, but we also can't be blaming mothers for the children not being near them 24 seven. But how are we, what are we able to do? What are the tips for us to be good enough parents to make sure our kids live a secure and as safe a life as possible? I know earlier you mentioned starting to speak to your kids from the age of two. Many of us are daunted about being able to have a discussion with our children that also opens them up to know that there are people out there that may hurt them in that way. So how are we able to broach this topic with our children? Well, I think it's, you know, you are absolutely correct. You don't want to instill uh, uh, anxiety yes. and fear in young children, children that are still just developing and growing and learning to trust mm. their environment. Because if we look at the life cycle of Erickson talks about trust versus mistrust yes. and children start in exploring internally before they start exploring the external world. So obviously they're going to reach out to them their primary caregiver mm. and, and one has to obviously take this very seriously and sensitively without uh, traumatizing mm. the child. But I think it's it's starting with basic, basic uh, information about their body parts, what what does each part of the, the function of each part of the body and about talking about uh, safe touches and unsafe touches, demonstrating that. Like when does one shake hands? When does one actually give a pat on the back when when does one actually give a peck on the cheek mm -hmm. and, and and how does all those kind of touches feel then demonstrating when somebody pinches you or pulls you or pushes those kind of touches and then explaining to children so what is acceptable mm -hmm. what is not acceptable what is safe and what is not safe? What feels yucky inside? Something that tells you it's not okay. So that's the kind of things to reassure the child slowly, to say to the child, it's also teaching empathy to the child, yes. to say, it's this, this feels good, this feels nice, and that is how other people would also like to be touched. But we do not talk about good touches and bad touches because some of the sexual touches mm. will obviously evoke pleasurable sensations mm. and we don't want to instill feelings of guilt yes. or misunderstandings in children so we would not talk about good touches and bad touches but talk about secrets as well yes the, the good secrets 
the bad secrets, the good secrets about a surprise birthday party, a surprise gift. Those so children start understanding, yes. obviously according to the age of the child, yes. and engaging with the child, going through this drill. It's using that golden thread, pulling that golden thread. So even using ideal routine times with the child, bedtime, bath time. Okay. Bath time, getting them to identify their body parts again and playing the what if game with the child. So what if your brother Muhammad came and pinched you? Is that acceptable? Would that feel okay? Mm. Why wouldn't it feel okay? Is it okay for you to pinch your brother? But what I'm saying is to make to, uh, an awareness. Awareness. So the child slowly starts grasping the concept mm. but you can't suddenly tell a child that if somebody comes to give you sweets you must run you must scream you must shout or yell that obviously yes. is going to instill a lot of fear in the child or confusion yes. and that could result in trauma so you start planting the seed slowly and gradually ensuring that there's consistency and that uh, reinforcing this mm -hmm. regularly because as the child grows older obviously your conversations could become more uh, sophisticated and more in-depth yes. so the, you know and you just take each child and see how it goes individually indeed. as well uh, dr Scheider, i have to there's two questions that i have to ask you about the one is though when we're talking about things like this when we're talking about the increase of incidence of abuse we see many people in adulthood now talking about things that have happened to them in childhood Childhood. a lot in our community has been resurfacing as well but it's always it's not always strangers it's not that stranger that's watching in a restaurant or somebody that's out in a mall for me that's a little bit more daunting because it could very well be in your own family indeed Zahira as we know and this is not just statistics that 80 to 90 percent of the time it is always somebody that is known to the victim somebody that has some other form of relationship to the victim. It could be a family friend, it could be an educator, it could be a sports coach, it could be anybody, it could be a religious instructor, it could be an uncle, a grandparent, an aunt, anybody. And that is the reality we mm. are faced with. And that is why we, we emphasize that sex and sexuality is such an important conversation. Yes. We need to cherish the subject. To, to ensure that that subject is opened up at home, yes. not just outside of the context of that home environment, within a safe and secure environment where parents know the kind of information they want to impart and transfer to their child so that the child has respect for yes. sex, something that it ha that has to be cherished in the long mm. term, Some, and to start respecting their bodies, the bodies of others. It's not teaching your child mm. to go out and, and uh, engage in sexual intercourse, certainly not. Mm. I think if there's that kind of communication, it also gives the child an opportunity and permission if there are any concerns if, if an, uh, a relation or friend, family friend mm. or anybody known to the child has behaved untowardly towards the child, the child will feel safe enough to actually say, yes. mom and dad spoke to me about this, I'm going to go and share this with them, even though threats and intimidation or coercion has been thrust upon this child, this child will still go forward. But instead, what happens is parents are shy. They don't know how to begin this conversation. Yes. They're often afraid. They think that they would, they would do more damage or harm to the child and therefore would refrain from engaging in these kind of discussions. And I certainly encourage family and, and uh, parents to actually go forward and say, you know what, the subject is hard for me. I've given it so much thought. I'm a bit embarrassed. I don't know where to begin. But after thinking this through, I think we need to talk. Whether it's mom with daughter, yes. dad with son, whatever. But they need to. There are books out there, and maybe I can we can put it on the website as Fantastic. well to engage in these kind of conversations to make it easier to facilitate yes. and that is what when we talk about positive parenting that is all part yes. of positive parenting because then the child feels safe and feels secure that I can go to my parents I don't need to go to the internet and learn 
or make uh, assumptions yes. or process information in whatever way I understand it. But this is coming from, from a very secure background, mm. experienced, skilled, loving and caring you know, group of people. So I That's think that it. is what we need to look out for. But what you're saying is, it's not just the stranger danger in terms of the kidnappings and abductions and luring children, but it's people close to home. And That's we it. need to realize that, that when a child comes forward, please, please to parents and anybody out there, listen to that child. You know, if a child demonstrates age inappropriate behavior, that will be a telltale sign that something has happened to this child. Mm. If the child has age inappropriate knowledge, a five, six year old, seven year old telling you about sexual acts or engaging in French kissing, obviously that will tell you, no, something, something has happened. Is wrong. We need to look at the motive. Why would a child create or confabulate a story? Mm. What does the child have to gain from that kind of of sharing of knowledge and even with older children there's a huge stigma attached to it. That's it they wouldn't want to come forward and share that kind of information so we always say please listen that's it and i think dr shad has made a very valid point is that we need to be providing these safe spaces for our children in our home environment that they don't even have to hesitate or think twice about coming to us and saying actually i think something may be wrong whether it's for them or it's for another friend or for another family member but they need to be able to have access to the information firstly to know what's wrong and the second thing is to be able to say something's not right i need to talk about it and that's the only thing we can i think a very pertinent thing that we can provide dr shida when we're looking at this what are the signs and symptoms to look out for because when i think about it you know as much as we all feel we are very hands-on parents. Um, what are the signs and symptoms for us to look out for? Because we're busy and I'm worried that I don't want to have missed something that's so wrong in, that happened. If Allah forbid that ever happens to any of our children, what, what are we looking out for? So you're asking something so important and crucial in, in the lives of children because often children act out. They don't always directly articulate. They, don't, they do not find themselves in a position where they can actually say, mommy, this has happened to me. So we would look out for the behavioral indicators, the psychological indicators, the emotional indicators. Under behaviors, you would look at dramatic mood changes. Mm -hmm. A child that has been outwardly open, extroverted, suddenly becomes silent, withdrawn, uh, shows uh, depression, yes. a lot of uh, weepiness, mm -hmm. outbursts. Those are the kind of things that one would look at and one needs to look at symptoms uh, not in isolation but a cluster of symptoms mm. so more than one symptom you cannot just jump to a foregone conclusion that something has happened to my mm. child you would look so behaviors in terms of school performance if the child is going to school or the child refuses to go to school now mm. You know, the child cries, I don't want to go, because that's probably where something is going on in the child's yes. life. Or refuses to go to the grandparents' home uh, and says, I don't want to go. And obviously you think, ah, my child's just putting up temper tantrums, they're going through a phase in their life. But one needs to explore, what is it that the unsaid word is yes. telling me now? In terms of psychological indicators here, one would see uh, eating disorders, sleeping disorders, recurrent nightmares, a lot of uh, 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 other, uh, you know, when we talk about eating, sleeping, there would also be aging appropriate behaviors where the child could mm. also be sexualizing uh, non-sexual objects. Yes. So, and then emotionally, where there might be loss of bowel or bladder control, mm. there might be uh, a child that had a re you know, regular digestive system suddenly becomes constipated or they cannot control their bowel or their bladder. So these are some of the things that mm. one needs to look out for. There are many symptoms, yes. but I always say, please do not take things for granted because often children will somatize the psychosomatic yes. with psychological indicators. It's the unexplained stomach aches, headaches, and other uh, 
ailments or pains mm. that you know medically there's no explanation for yes dr shida i think this is a conversation that is so needed um i know you are a wealth of information and we thank you for your service to our community and to our country because i think we need more people like you to be a voice for so many of the voiceless uh, that are unable to speak for themselves for those that are not strong enough to speak for themselves and shukran for you being you and for being in that position to do that and thank you so much for making the time to share with our viewers is the little that we can start doing to make sure that we do the best that we can by our children shukran the leelan and i just want to say to the viewers out there evil prospers when no action is taken it's time now and i think 2010 when the, the slogan was kinako i yes. think it's time now we all need to stand up together and take action absolutely i think dr shida summed it up very very well this is a difficult topic to discuss but it's something that's needed to be discussed we need to discuss it in our households on a continuous basis look out for dr shida's articles she's always quoted in the newspapers look out for the information that she puts out there get in touch with the teddy bear clinic see what you can do in your schools in your communities how you can raise awareness for this but let's do what we can and like dr shida says the time is now if we need to protect our children i'm not just talking about mine all our children in south africa we need to take an active uh, step forward and we need to make sure that we are responsible as a community in as active participants active parenting and positive parenting let's start making that difference now stay tuned we'll continue the conversation with our next guest <laughs> Assalamu alaikum and welcome back after that ad break. As we were talking about it's a worrying time in our community it's a worrying time in our country actually worldwide for being a parent. We worry all the time to make sure our kids are safe and Dr. Shahid has given us some good tips in terms of making sure we do the best that we can for our children to make them sufficiently and age appropriately aware and how to almost protect themselves but now in studio with us to continue the conversation on how we can do active and positive parenting we have a remarkable counseling psychologist nadira lunat baghdadi nadira is well known she's always speaking out on women on self esteem how to build ourselves but today we have her in studio uh, in studio with us to talk a little bit about how we can protect our children at school level how are we building self esteem what are we doing about bullying because this is something that is also tying into the process of making making sure we keep our children safe and keeping them in safe environments. Nadira assalamu alaikum and welcome to the studio. Wa alaikum salam. Thanks so much for having me. It is such a pleasure to have you here. Nadira, this is a topic that's very pertinent. In the media recently as we spoke to Dr. Shaida, we seeing re- heightened uh reporting on uh the sexual abuse amongst women, mm-hmm. men and children. Uh we seeing a lot of uh kidnapping issues. But then we also talking about other spaces where our kids are not being safe. Mm-hmm. Recent articles I've been reading are saying that children as young as 12 years old are being diagnosed with clinical depression. Clearly we're missing something along the line. Yeah. No, I do agree with you. I think um I think the change in our environment also needs to take place. I think it's very much uh the different social ecological structures and uh looking into how from the top down it actually has an impact on the unrest or the the well-being mm. of even to a cellular level yes. of a child as well yeah when we talk about i mean the sexual abuse has been the one thing uh the kidnappings that we've already also discussed mm. with dr shida but when it comes to schooling environments we as parents think okay we're sending our children to school they should be safe there it should be okay there and we take a little comfort knowing that they've gone from one safe environment to the next but it's not always the case in many many situations mm. we seeing a heightened incidence again of bullying i know many schools are coming out with uh memorandums and constitutions adding the bullying that bullying is not acceptable how to deal with bullying how is this becoming something that you also seeing a lot more of yes yes most certainly i think it's been going on for a long time mm-hmm. i think um when there certain cases that are quite severe where it turns to suicide or if it's someone prominent in the community we become more aware of these things but it has been going on for a long long time now um i think 
I, I actually was speaking to some psychiatrists and educational psychologists who recently said that they find that it's almost like a spring fever that's yes. come in. Um, and there's a lot of unrest in schools that is actually taking place at the moment. So definitely an increase in it. Um, I think a lot of hostility, a lot of aggression, a lot of anger mm. and um, how it's actually been um, put onto little kids or uh, less able kids to defend themselves. So yeah. let's talk, I want to break this down into two things. Yeah. The first one I want to ask about is the child that's doing the bullying or the teacher that's doing the bullying or whoever that person is. How are we able to, if I'm the parent of a child and I'm repeatedly called into school saying your child is showing these behaviors, is hurting other children, but I know my child's a good child. Do I just give up because I'm so tired of being called all the time? What am I able to do or what am I missing or what is happening with this child that we need to know about? Okay, I think behavioral difficulties are for a number of reasons. Um, a lot of the time it stems down to other areas of the life that um, needs to actually be seen to. Um, children usually have misconduct when they feel disconnected. Mm. And the difficulty is we're living in a world that is surrounded by um, a sense of separation and isolation. We don't see it, it's very much embedded in our capitalistic society. Mm. So. Um, and, and, you know, technology, it allows us to be, feel connected, but very superficially. Mm. And uh, that just, I think the way that life is structured has allowed us to have that us or myself and other yes. sort of a, an idea. And as soon as we see somebody as different to us or as a threat to us getting ahead in life or an obstacle in getting ahead, um, it can cause us to retaliate because it really triggers the survival mode within mm. ourselves. So we go into fight, flight, or freeze mode. Um, and that, that is how it manifests into intolerance that we see happening, not only in schools, we see it on social media with cyberbullying as well, but very much in schools as well. I do believe it's also the social and emotional development of children. I think very early in our life we've shifted from actually dealing with um, relationship building, with connecting with our children, mm -hmm. with um, making them feel regulated at an early age in mm -hmm. their lives and we kind of surpassing all of that and moving towards being more productive. Yes. So we're pressuring our children very early in their life and it's feeding into the capitalistic values and ideologies yes. of being competitive, of seeing to the individual self other than others. Um, I read an article that actually spoke about uh, a parent's advice to a child that actually said that sometimes on your way to the top you need to step on grass blades. Mm -hmm which gives us a sense of how we as individuals grasp the social um, you know, upheaval of the time, also the social values of the time. And we, we grasp, as, especially with me little, we yes. grasp all these small things in modeling behavior and things around us, computer games, all of these things. So we do see that children with, um, there's been a number of studies done uh, there was a belief that people with low self-esteem would bully by compensating for their low self-esteem. But then um, there were others that actually debunked that. Um, very recently, they found that that would be dependent on other moderating factors. So things yes. like if, say, the school environment or the home environment mm -hmm. or even culture um, is very much positive. Yeah. So I, if, if it's positive, sorry, the yeah. self-esteem would be uh, a good thing. Absolutely. But if it's negative, then self-esteem could result in bullying. So I think the context is what we need to focus on a little bit more. Absolutely. And I think you also made a very valid point there about the way we're parenting, that we are competitive. We instill that in our children, that we say at any cost, make sure you get A, B, C, D. Yes. And I don't know if that is positive parenting because what, what we're doing and damaging in the social aspects tends to resonate over and over again in these children's lives for many years to come. Most certainly. I think um, with children very early in their life, 
they need, because we're social beings by nature, so our biology needs us to feel like we're connected to someone. Mm. From as early as a child being in their mommy's stomach, yes. feeling connected through the mother's voice, through the, through the soothing sound of the mother's voice, and then later on through connecting, even through babbling, through talking to the child, um, through showing empathy and compassion when the child's in mm. pain and smiling back at the child. It gives them the sense that I exist and I'm seen and I'm worthy of being yes. loved. But uh, very early, we already, when we conceive, I know I've done it as a, a child already planning what gadgets I need, how much I need to budget. And I'll never forget how the midwife actually looked at me and she says, does the child even know what you, what you have or what you don't have for them? What are the basic needs? Yes. And I looked at that and I thought to myself, that's so profound because we always already planning what universities they're going to. Are we going to send them to a public school, a private school? What's best? Um, and we become caught up in the rut of life. And that already just shows the competitive nature and also the fast-paced nature of our world. Yes. And we actually need to connect with the children very early in their lives. So they're not ready to just be pushed into all of this competitiveness. Um, eventually then we know terbia. That's it. Yeah, it's relationship and through the relationship character building but first the foundation needs to be actually building that relationship with your child and they're more likely to come to you when they're bullied absolutely because then the doors are open which is exactly what dr shada was saying we need to be, be able to create these safe spaces mm -hmm. so our children are able to come to us to say there's a problem now let's just move on to the child that's being bullied yeah. how are we able to do what we need to do to help that child. What if it's my child that's being bullied? What am I doing or not doing as a parent that allows the space to happen? Okay, I think a lot of the time uh, teachers in studies have shown that children who seem weaker mm. um, in any way or less able or competent or adequate are likely to be targets of bullying. But then other studies say, you know what, confident people have been bullied. Yes. Because if the bully chooses that, you know, decides that you are a threat to them, they're likely to bully you. They don't discriminate on that. Um, but things that we need to take into consideration. Nadira, I'm going to just, okay. I'm so sorry no, to cut you there. I'm going to ask you just to pause so that I don't have to cut that line a little further. When we come back, we've got to take a very quick ad break. When we come back after the ad break, we're going to be speaking about the child that is bullied in a school environment and what we can do to assist in health. There. Stay tuned. Assalamu alaikum and welcome back. We're chatting to da Nadira Lunat Baghdadi, a counseling psychologist well known for her stance on women empowerment, working with self esteem issues, working with children as well with regards to building self-esteem and she was the right person to chat to when we talk about active and positive parenting we've spoken a little bit earlier about the bully at school what if this was our child how do we address it but now we're talking a little bit about the child being bullied mm -hmm. and we said it's not always linked to self-esteem yeah so what if it is my child that's being bullied at school what am i able to do as a parent to be able to tell my child that this space is your private space and you're not allowed to, well, you're not allowed to, but you shouldn't be letting people violate that space. Mm -hmm. And I think that is very important. Like I said, first and foremost, we as parents need to have a relationship with our children yes. to be able to get through to them. I think different ages and we find that children don't always get our care for them the way we intend it to be. Mm -hmm. So for us to go slow, we all know our children. So you know what will work, do you need to gradually bring up the topic, um, whether it's brought up by them, how do you go about doing this, are they more private or do they prefer being around in a bigger crowd for you to discuss this in a more generalized situation. Um, so discussing these things I think even as preventative work, um, in just taking a scenario of what may happen on the news and speaking about it almost as if it's detached from your situation, but what would you do in that situation? So they can themselves, while they're calm and not in survival mode, not in, uh, in you know, that mode where they need to defend themselves, be able to, in a contained place, come up with things that mm. are, uh, will ensure their safety. So physical safety, first things first, yes. you know, um, looking into how they can get away from the bully to make sure that they aren't in close contact with the bully by themselves because often bullying is not done in broad daylight. It's 
done um, behind yes. closed doors or where people don't see it unless it's socially acceptable by other people. Mm. So we need to think of that physical safety first. Um, some children want to then compensate for their low self-esteem or for other passwords by suddenly when they get support become courageous to stand up for themselves just to make them aware and go through their safety mm -hmm. and what can be implicated if they do do that. So sometimes uh, certain personalities don't take well to it and they come back with a bigger hit the next time. Mm -hmm. So do you rather just ignore them and walk away? Do you physically depend, uh, defend yourself? I do believe that uh, you know acting against and it's my personal thing violence with violence doesn't always work yeah. yeah and sometimes we find that the ones that are being bullied bully as well eventually but i have to then ask you also i understand that those aspects but we're also moving into a time where we're seeing social media bullying and this is not just amongst kids we're seeing this with adults and mm. we're seeing women in our generations bullying each other on a social media space how are we able to deal with that while still keeping a sense of self-esteem, a sense of who you are intact. Yeah, it's, it's a huge difficulty. I've seen people break down. I've seen people go into a depressed stupor because mm. of it. There's been stories of suicide as a result mm. of this. Uh, there's even cases of people being on websites, um, actually uh, having footage of their suicide attempts, uh, which is quite sad. And this mm. is men as well. So um, we know social media doesn't discriminate between uh, a person that is depressed or not. Mm. If they've already got a lot of anxiety, if they're struggling with emotional and psychological difficulties, um, you come in at your own risk. And mm. that's the tough part. Um, Cyberbullying, I think, is a huge difficulty. I think emotionally and psychologically, we haven't been adequately um, taught how to manage mm. uh, cyberbullying. We haven't been taught how to use technology. It's not that technology as a platform is bad, it's that we haven't connected with ourselves. Yes. We haven't learned how to connect properly with other people. So now using this um, sometimes becomes a form of distraction. Yes, It becomes an addiction a lot of the time because we're looking to uh, validate or to fulfill our inner emptiness through actually discussing our our lives and putting our lives onto social media which allows other people behind these screens then because they're you, mm. you know anonymous to actually um, beat and bully people um, and it's, it's a tough life like I said you go into survival mode because this person could be threatening to your life your life may not be as good as that influencer's mm. life and now suddenly I have the chance to put her down to size to make myself feel better mm. so taking all of these into consideration I do believe that um, entertaining the negativity is just gonna allow it to carry on Absolutely. so personally I would feel like just either deleting that comment or just not even noticing it at all not giving it a second look because mm -hmm. it can very well have an impact absolutely on you. Yeah. how are we able to build our children's self-esteem um, I know this is for women as well, this is for anyone who is watching because this is something we all struggle with. But specifically for our children, how are we able as parents to boost their self-esteem so that they do have the courage to be able to stand up and say this is wrong or that's not right or to be able to say this is a safe space where I belong. What can we do as parents? Okay, so this starts very early in a child's life and there's been a lot of controversy around the, the whole idea of self-esteem mm. because self-esteem is really a subjective inner evaluation of your self-worth. Mm. And it's often at a given time because it can fluctuate. Mm. I can feel good about myself when I'm around kiddies and then suddenly when I'm around a group of diplomats and people who are, you know, of high caliber, I can feel like I'm nothing, you mm. know, and sometimes it's in comparison. I call it the felony of comparison like because uh, really we tend to do that. Mm. We tend to, it's us and the other, and that's again the yes. separation when in actual fact we need to feel connected to other people. Yes. So very early in our life, in children's lives, we can teach them emotional and um, emotional and social development. Mm. Uh, working on that is very imperative at different ages, knowing the age of the child and the appropriate notes of it, as well as the cognitive development, mm -hmm. because, you know, the stages where concrete um, yes. development is happening before that, the sense of comparing themselves to others because they know themselves in comparison to a group when they're in earlier um, mm -hmm. school going children as well. So 
there is a difficulty when it comes to um, actually stroking a child's self-esteem because we believe the more we praise our children it's good but sometimes they become so dependent on outward validation they depend on it so much so that the inner worth does not um, speak to them mm. uh, and and often it depends on the environments they are so self-esteem is something that's such a broad topic to actually discuss but i do believe it's more about self-worth like which that. helps uh, which actually works through conscious parenting, through um, social and emotional development very, very early in a child's life. And I think the one thing that you've, uh, that's you've been a thread from what Dr. Shada said, from what you said, is this connectedness. That yes. because of social media, because of technology, because of the busyness in our lives, we've lost this connectedness to humanity, to each other, which is why we're missing out on so much that's happening. Mm. And it comes back to us finding that connectedness again with our children. Definitely. I think as soon, very early in, our, in their lives, if they feel connected to us, it gives us them a sense of being connected to themselves. Mm -hmm. So the difficulty is the mind and body, um, you know, we know now the mind and body is interlinked and sometimes when we don't feel connected and often people um, in a capitalist society mm. in the modern day life we don't connect with our feelings especially boys yes. we teach them we teach them very early in their lives boys don't cry and all yes. of these things yeah which doesn't allow them to then connect with the way they feel but that is the essence of who you are when you're connected with the way you feel you're more likely to be a bit more resilient and it allows you to regulate your feelings yes. so you're less likely to hurt others because you no longer so um you know uh overturned by your own emotions yes. you are able to self-regulate a little bit more and also show compassion so a lot of eq is important i was going to ask you about that because yeah. we've put so much emphasis on iq and children being yes. developed and children being creative and we've lost the sense of compassion uh, and eq and our children are not able to show empathy uh, to anything around them because again as you rightly pointed out, we've become so far removed because of social media, the connectedness to humanity is no longer there. Are we able to teach EQ? Yeah, EQ, that's the beauty of it, is IQ is a little bit more static. EQ, sorry, is um, can be taught, and that's the beauty of it. Um, so very early, or whenever, even us as adults, we can learn how to, and I do it with a lot of people, is then connecting to your feelings. Simple things like, checking in on yourself all the time. How does that make me feel? You know, that's yes. psychologists, we know them and we laugh about <laughs> that stereotype. But it's really, it has, it, it has its place. It's there for a reason. How is this making me feel? Because often we so focus on the outside world and what people expect, we tend not to check in. And But you know, you're saying that, and I, and I think it's such a valid point because we seldom do that with our children. We often don't do that for ourselves, where we check in to see, are we okay at this point in definitely, time? Definitely, definitely. And that is why I work with parents. Mm -hmm. I think um, it's important for us to actually look into the parents' well-being and for us to become conscious of our own things when Absolutely. we parent with our children because they model our behavior. They pick absolutely. these things up. Nadra, yeah. it's been absolutely wonderful to hear from you and thank you so much for sharing your insights with us. I think we've learned so much between uh, Nadra and Dr. Shida today, uh, this connectedness, this active parenting, this providing of safe spaces. And I think the one topic that we'll have to get Dr. Nadra back in studio on is on building EQ because I think that's something we can teach our children is on empathy as well. So thank you so much for joining it's us here today. It's been a pleasure. It's been a real pleasure. Uh, so. Topics of discussion today uh, are things that we need far more than just one segment in a show on, uh, whether it's been on the sexual abuse, the kidnapping, the bullying, the self-esteem, the self-awareness, the connectedness, the active conscious parenting. There's so much that we can do. There's so much that we need to do. As Dr. Shada said, the time is right now. What Nadira said is ties in so much for me from what we learn on parenting from an Islamic perspective, that for the first seven years, play with your children. For the next seven years, teach them. For the seven years after that, be their friend. And that ties in so much with the advice being given of allowing them those safe spaces, allowing them to feel that connectedness in our busyness and in our everyday lives of trying to make things work. Let's just slow down. Let's take a moment to be 
connected to our children so that they feel that they've got us all the time unconditionally and let's go back into the spirit of Ubuntu and doing community parenting where we are actively responsible for everyone around us. Today has been a difficult topic to discuss on many many levels but one that is much needed and I hope that we do get to pick up the conversation again with our guests in studio and with others out there and I think it's time that we all started having these discussions. Shukran so much for joining us today. We look forward to seeing you again. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.